about how the tribes were, the ten tribes were dissolved into the whole world. So naming the tribes has no um, political meaning because they don't exist in that, in that form. So most probably they, they mean the whole world as Israel is dissolved in it. So when, uh, when Abraham was told that in your seed, all the generations of the earth will be blessed. So this is almost literally happened in the exile. There, so, is, there is one missing tribe, right? The tribe Dan. of Dan, right. And the tribe of Dan was, uh, Dan is the, is the second child from the, the, uh, the, the slave girl of uh, Rachel. Bila, when she found herself without children, so she gave her uh, her maid girl, like Sarah had done with it, right? right? Like Sarah. Yeah, like Sarah, exactly. So she uh, she gave him Bila, and Bila gave him two sons, Dan and Nephtali. And Dan was, uh, was the one. When Jacob wanted to bless Dan, he said he's a serpent. A serpent. He called him a serpent. Benjamin was a wolf. Judah was a lion, so he gave different, <laughs> so he thinks of his own household like a zoo, in a way. <laughs> so Dan being a serpent uh, was considered by the rabbis as a bad sign for the tribe. So you're saying that after the Roman conquest, the identity of the tribes was lost? It's actually after the Assyrian, when the northern tribes, the kingdom of the north, was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians actually kind of worked on dissolving their identity. They broke them down into small groups or families, and they sent them everywhere. Ah, so that, that, that when they came back after... Only the Judah. Only right, the, right. So the first, the first exile was the Israelites, the uh, ten tribes up north and nobody came back. Right. They brought in their place other ethnicities and they planted them in the land and they later on they became known as the Samaritans. Yes. Oh. So the Samaritans was the replacement of the ten tribes. Whatever left in the, in the, in the land was like very poor, very... They, 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 they were meaningless. Whatever they left. The Assyrian left some few people that were just nobody. So they mixed them with foreign people, and they mixed their culture, mixed their religion, everything. So I, the, the Judas, Judaizers, the, the tribe of Judah who came back from the Babylonian exile, not from the Assyrian, the second exile. When they came back and established their kingdom, the Samaritans fought with them. They didn't want them. So there was enmity between the two all the time. And the Samaritans, if they kept the Torah, they kept, only, uh, they kept the, the Old Testament, they kept only the Torah. They didn't keep... The prophets, because the first prophets were very unhappy with the Samaritans. They were not giving them a, a kind treatment. So the Samaritans had a very strong negative feeling toward Judaizers, and Judaizers <laughs> likewise. They hated the Samaritans, literally. You see that in that direction, that, 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 that dialogue between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And they had a different uh, temple. They, have they had their own sacrifices. Exactly. But they mixed their worship with pagan practices. They had their own ideology that came with the people that the Assyrians inserted in the place. They brought foreign people. They had nothing to do with the God of Israel. But the local people said, there's a God here that you cannot just bring your foreign gods to the local God of the land, and you're going to be in trouble if you start doing this. And they started having some problems. So the foreign people started to yield to the Israelite God. And this was a common practice. You go to a visit to visit a country, you ask about the local gods, because you don't want to offend that local god. They, they say, for example, the, the Canaanites, they were worshipping the Balin, the, the lord of fertility. So the Israelites coming into their ground, their land, they asked, so what do you do for the local god? Because they, he's a god of farming. Now we were shepherds, now we're going to have to go into farming, so our god is taking care of shepherds. But we don't have any knowledge of how to farm. So they tell them this is the practice. You go on certain days, offer these sacrifices, do this, do this, do this. 
So they had to follow the God of the land that was more dangerous than the weapons of the Canaanites on the Israelites. That's why Elijah kept saying, don't, don't kind of dwindle, don't, don't go back and forth between God and Baal. If God is the, the Lord, is God, then worship him. If Baal is God, is but don't keep going back and forth. So the same thing for the Samaritans. They came into the land and they asked, who is the God of this land? They told them, this is Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, who is living here before you. So they took on the Bible, the, the, the Bible and took on the practices, but they kept other things with it. And uh, the prophets would keep, keep saying that to them, do not do this, you have to come to the temple to worship. And the response was, no, you want to subdue us, we know the history, we don't want to be that, doing that. We're going to have our own temple. <coughs> so this is like the brief history of the, the Samaritans. So the, Dan was one of these tribes that was taken out and never came back. None of them came back. And we talked about the third song, about the multitude of the people dressed in white. And at the end, we talked about how this song, the last one, which is salvation belongs to our God in verse 10, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their, their, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. They amen to the prayer of the multitude of the saved. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. There is an experiential singing. They had experienced something. And because of that experience, they shout with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. And we talked about that in details, what kind of experience these people had, the one in white robes and old palm leaves. It's the experience of transformation. To be God-like in their bodies. We talked about this, how the whole creation awaits the, the adoption. The whole creation awaits the transformation. Everything in heaven and on earth waiting on humans that God had loved and redeemed. What would happen to them? St. Paul spoke about it in Roman. St. John, in the first letter, St. John, chapter 3. And um, uh, St. Peter. So this transformation is spoken about vividly in the New Testament. And this would be the reason for, when a person looks at themselves, the reason for the singing, person looks at themselves and himself and herself and see that they are actually no more uh, liable to death. They're not going to die anymore. And look to themselves and they're not going to get tired. They don't get sad or afraid. They're not going to get sick. They actually have complete understanding and clear vision of things. St. Paul said that he said, and then I will know as I am known. That's a very significant thing. Now I am known, God knows me, but then I will know as I am known. means my vision will be very clear. Now we look through a mirror, through a dim page, but then face to face. And mirror, mirror concept is one of the fascinating things in the New Testament. Um, so, this is the singing that will happen from that experience. And the response will be by the heavenly creatures. He, he, he recites all the heavenly creatures. He says, he numbers them. Uh, and the elders, and the priests, and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, to the song of those saved people. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And we said the great tribulation is not an event that is limited by time. It's a continuous thing. There's many verses in the New Testament that says, the great tribulation starts from the cross of Christ. Once the cross was erected, and they took it out from the ground, and they put it up like that, <laughs> that is the sign. We started. It began. Like, I like what uh, Mel Gibson did in the Passion of the Christ. 
when he, on the mouth of St. Mary, he, he puts her at the cross and they raise the cross. Actually, no, it was the night when they started questioning him. When they took him into the cemetery, she said, it began. It began. And there's a lot that began that night. So that sign that was erected is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. And Jesus said it, in the world you will have tribulation. Mm -hmm. St. John says, I am your partner in the tribulation. That's in the chapter 1. We looked at it before. I am, I am John, your partner. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus. So that tribulation, there's no more tribulation, it's one tribulation. But apparently at the end of times it will be very severe. Which Jesus had, you know, give, give an example, exemplified it in the giving of birth. The woman who is pregnant is about to give birth. She says, the doctors tell her, when you feel pain in, in your lower back, and he's like knocking, right? I, I didn't experience that. <laughs> right? It feels like knocking, like somebody's like having a hammer and just giving you at the back. And they say, you have to stop preparing yourself to come to the hospital. If you're a primary first one, you know, take your time. It's not a big deal. It's going to take maybe 10, 12 hours a day. But if it's your second, don't linger. It's going to happen very quickly. So once you start this process, keeps getting escalated and it gets more frequent. The spaces between the, the, the pain gets shorter and the pain gets severer. And at the end it would tighten and will not let go. Just does this. And usually they start screaming. And then it's not going to stop. Then epidural. Exactly. <laughs> Thank God for epidural. But it, it doesn't stop, the, the pain does not stop until the baby is out. So I think the great tribulation, sometimes we think about it as um, one thing that's going to happen at the end of time. But that is unfair. Unfair to the martyrs and the people that are persecuted across history. There were like times that was very dark, and I don't think that human capacity can take more than that. No matter what you tell me. There is stories in the communist time about Christians being persecuted last century. To the extreme, to the extreme, and you know, we reach the capacity where people cannot stand anymore, let alone. It's not only just physical pain, emotional, psychological, moral, you name it. So uh, I, I think this is more realistic to say, this tribulation from the Bible and from what we see. It's an ongoing stuff from the cross all the way to the end of times. Um, then the angel, so he said, I'm sorry, uh, for the Lamb, the verse, so who are they? And this, he said, they came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. That's the first promise. They serve, he will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. There's images from Exodus. Just This is the first thing that strikes us, because it's a vivid image of Exodus. When the people of God went through the Red Sea and came out, oh, they came out into a desert, a dry place. They could not find water to drink. They complained said, you brought us out. After this great, beautiful singing, there was a complaint. Um, so, Genesis, so you remember. Parting the Red Sea is chapter 14. Parting the Red Sea is chapter 14 in Exodus. The great song of salvation, which is the first host of our Tasbaha, is chapter 15. So they get out, they sing, excited, like euphoria. Then chapter 16, is a, com a complaint about food. Mm -hmm. We're hungry. And God sent them, chapter 16 is the manna and the quail. Chapter 17 is another complaint about water. And then God gives them the water from the rock. And then chapter 18 is preparation for the uh, 
the the mountain. Nineteen, they start. They stand by the mountain and they sign a contract with God, a covenant with blood. Chapter twenty is where God gives the Ten Commandments. Just to remember, this is a very very specific piece from the Torah that is very important and is echoed here. They come out of the earth here in this in this kind of fulfillment of this uh, prophecy. Come out of the earth, shouting to God, saying, "Salvation belongs to our God." and people are following them, heavenly creatures. But immediately he assures everybody that there will not be hunger nor thirst. So that there's no need to go through chapter 16 and 17 of Exodus again, because there is not Moses here. It is actually the Lamb himself, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I think this is a very amazing verse. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that God... So they're coming out of the tribulation. They're coming from hard times. And there's a lot of tears. Sometimes there's a lot of tears inside the person, but they don't know how to bring it out. Cries that is never actually let happen. But what does it mean that God will wipe away? Would God have a handkerchief? Very big. No sadness. So that, that means there will be no sadness, but to wipe tears means I'm making here tears that has never been spilled. I, this verse has a meaning, you know, in, in, in a way. If we can just understand it in a, in a metaphorical way. What does that mean that God will wipe tears that has not even no, in my for their eyes? I just think it is a little bit different because I think if I go about that, I say, okay, all right, there's no more suffering, but what can I, what am I going to do with the memories the of sad things? I'm going to sit down in uh, in, uh, in heaven and pout and cry. And just give me a second here. I mean, everybody's excited, and just give me a second. I need to sit down and cry over my spent years on earth. And somebody's going to say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Just forget about earth. Let's go to. Uh, is he going to wipe the memories too? That's the yeah. thing. I don't think God's going to wipe the memories. He's actually going to transform the memories. The thing that causes <coughs> to be mem remembering sadness is going to be flipped into reason for joy. I, I remember, for, and that, what, what made me think about this is a, the story of Padre Teo. He had, the, he had a story to say about how uh, we see suffering from our point. We see suffering from here, from the earth, as something meaningless, harmful, unnecessary. Why God allow things like this? It's very sad. It's very. It makes us very much doubt God's sovereignty and love. He said it's like a child sitting on the ground. I think I said this before. So sitting on the ground, at the feet of his mother, and his mother is knitting. So he looks from the barn, he sees the back side of the knitting, and he says to his mother, what is this jumble of threads? You're spending a lot of energy and time on a meaningless, something meaningless, that doesn't seem nice. Just, there's any wisdom to this? I don't see any wisdom. So what does the mother do? She flips it to the other side and shows him the meaning of all this jumble. There's a meaning on the other side that we don't see. He sees it. So I'm thinking, wiping eyes here, meaning to flip the knitting. So we actually see. Hi, John. Hi. How did Andrew do? He did great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Proud of him. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. That there's much more to God's work about our inside than just changing our atmosphere. If salvation only involves that we change environments, then I might as well go to Alaska and not go to heaven or live in, uh, in the Himalayas. I don't know, you know, one of the nice places that has peace and quiet and beauty. That's not it. The change is going to be within us that even our memories will be transformed. So I think wiping away tears. Now we go to chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. 
And just a reminder, um, it's almost like... Uh, so he can tell time, John? About, he said. About. <coughs> Um, silence in heaven for about half an hour. Does that echo anything? Does that is linked to anything? Uh, is that when Jesus died on a cross? Or? There was silence. There was, silence. Silence. Mm -hmm. there was very. But it didn't say anything about a half an hour. So. Right. Also, uh, there is silence in the ten days between. Christ's ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing to be said. They were in prayer, awaiting. There's something great that's going to happen. And usually that silence in the Bible precedes something very profound, very significant. Like it's almost like somebody's taking a breath before they say a speech. Or they do this. And then they go on. So there is a silence, that, that, and we do this in the liturgy. I try to follow that. And, and, that, and that there is a silence period. Sometimes if we have time, we go a little bit longer. Between the request to have the Holy Spirit descend on us, mm -hmm. and going on for the transformation of the mystery, this is a silence we have in the Church. Are we supposed to keep silent about it, or pray about it? We, we pray. We, we keep pray, praying yes. about something. Yes. But we change the we shift we shift gears in a way. Um, there, I know the practices in the monasteries, especially in the Catholic monasteries. After each reading, they pause for maybe thirty seconds, which means that they would people will start taking in the things that they read. They don't move on. Just pause to let the words settle and let the heart kind of. Basque and the meetings. Um, they do that in the Catholic liturgy. They pause yes. after the reading the Bible. I've, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. It's a very good practice, actually. I hope that we can do this. Is it, it just gives a time for the reading to kind of soak in. Um, pauses in the in the worship has more power than the words. Both needed. But it is in the pauses that there is building, believe it or not. That's if we don't go straight. That if we don't really, if somebody's interested in prayer. But not, not long pauses, it shouldn't be like very long. For example, they tell you in the sleep that things are committed to long-term memory. Not in the... When they're awake. When awake. That's why they say kids who have cell phones with them at home and they keep them next to their bed, their performance in school goes down. And that's the reasoning. Because they don't get to commit it to long-term memory. So that silence, that quietness is the place where <coughs> major deep things happen. So in liturgies, in, old and the, in, the, in the old and the new, there was pauses in the liturgies. In the, in the practice, in the temple practice, there was a pause. So the image of trumpets, trumpets, is uh, liturgical from the Old Testament. The priests has trumpets. Uh, we're going to uh, look at that in, in chapter eight. Let me go back to uh, the book of Joshua and other. I think there's other places I'm going to go to. Um, The Exodus 2, what they can talk about. The trumpets. about the trumpets a little bit. Okay, 
chapter 6. It's about the destruction of Jericho. No, that's not a very happy image that uh, chapter 6 is given. Now, Jericho was securely shut up, and this is the first city after they crossed the Jordan from, from the kingdom of Jordan, from uh, Moab. They're going to cross, Moab is the old name for Jordan today. They cross the river, you become an Israel. So uh, when you go to uh, visit the places, and they go to the visit the place of baptism of our Lord, you're going to have, uh, you go from the Israeli side, of course, and um, on the other side, that you're going to find Jordanian soldiers standing on the other side, because this is a territory, this is a line of crossing. So they cross from Jordan to Israel, and the first city that you meet, uh, and it's a plain, it's a flat place, the first city you meet is Jericho. Um, so it was a fortified city, they, they said in the book of Joshua. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. Its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all, your, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. Every day they will go around the city one time. And, chapter, in the verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4, And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. See, so saying, take seven priests, put them in front of the ark, give them seven silver trumpets, or I'm sorry, seven trumpets of horns, ram horn. It's just coiled like this. Um, but the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear, it's not silver, I'm sorry, that's a mistake. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord, the shofar. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, and then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns for the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came up to the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, so they dead six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time, the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she did, she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take up the accursed <coughs> things and make the camp of Israel cursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. <clears throat> so this is the image, and they did, and, and they did, and so they, they went into the city. So what image is this, the trumpets, from the Bible, what is that? 
what does what 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 label what should I put on trumpets being blown by priests or angels? Trumpets of war fight. It's a war, yeah. It's a war, but also well, uh, herald of yeah. it's an announcement of judgment. It's not a herald of good news. Never, never. So the trumpets here is a herald of fighting that God is going to do against something and judge it. So it's something that's going to be destroyed, not something good. So this is what I think. Uh, so you got the same number, seven, and you got seven angels carrying the trumpets now. So let's read chapter eight and see. Where it going. When he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. We see incense again in heaven. So remember, just for us to remember. Moses, when he was given instruction to build the temple, because some people would say to you, um, Moses got the images of the temple and the altar and, and everything they're doing from the Egyptians, because he was raised up in Egyptian temples. And if you go and look at the Egyptian temples, they have something called the holy, and they have the holy of holies, where the priests offer things on behalf of the king or the people during harvest time, whatever, and the feasts. And the court outside, and they advance a little bit and do something for the king in the holy, but then the priests alone go into the holy of holies. So very similar to what Moses was told to do. So if somebody says that to you, there's a very detailed description of what God had told him. But when God told him this, he told him, this is what I'm going to show you, is an image of heavenly things, not do like the Egyptians. So what is the, the understanding, biblically, I would say? These people have an idea. We cannot deny that all nations at one point had some kind of partial revelation of truth, not full revelation. Like for example, you hear about Balaam, and he's a prophet, and he, God speaks to him. Who is Balaam? He's not an Israelite. Never was. He's from Mesopotamia. He's from Syria. So there's some kind of other communication that God had made, but the full revelation, the, the clear revelation was given to his people, Israelites, to become the priest. So in a way, everybody knows, everybody knows that the church service and you know the Bible, but when you don't want to go into specific details, you want to go to somebody who had spent time with it, had been dedicated to it. So we ask a priest, we ask a uh, a seminarian about the Bible. So you you know some medical information everybody has, you know, but when you really need the proper professional work, then you go to a doctor and so on and so forth. So it doesn't mean that the Israelites had a temple that made by instruction, through instruction from God, that the other nations had no knowledge at all about what things should be like. This is a very wrong idea. And, and working through the Old Testament and reading different resources on uh, on uh, inspiration, I came to realize that. There's actually places in the Old Testament that says, Did it, wasn't I that it, it helped the Kefturians, the Philistines, to get out of Keftur? Okay, there was an exodus for the Philistines, their own original land, to be, to be bringing them. So there's another exodus. He talks about, as if there's almost a history that God has with every nation. But this one, is the most intimate, the most clear. It's almost like face to face. But that's what I want us not to be kind of childish and think black and white. It's not always that. Okay. Egyptians had an encounter with God, definitely. Everybody has an encounter with God, but it was not very clear. So we go back to the chapter eight. So there's incense here. Incense is used everywhere to pagan gods. But there's a the prophecy from Malachi I spoke about it this week. Let's go with me to Malachi. Uh, we can we can say at least um, this verse.
545 in the Red Book. The last book Chapter 1, verse 11. It's talking about offerings. Which one over there? Uh, chapter 1, verse 11. So he's talking about bad sacrifices, evil sacrifices given to him by Israelites. But he's not very happy with it. In, in verse 10 he says, Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Okay, he says, I, you know, you're, you're, you're useless to me. It's actually better that you don't do it. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be, in the future, shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and the pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So, there is uh, that prophecy about incense being offered everywhere by the nations, and another offering, called, he called it a pure offering. And then incense is instructed to be offered by God to Moses when he showed him. He said, he, he made a, maybe we don't know this, he made a, a slideshow for Moses on the mountain. And on the mountain he showed him images. Go back with me to Exodus so that we know where, where incense is coming from in the beginning. There was incense among other people, like Egyptians, and there's a lot of offering of incense among nations. But as I say, is it this that Moses took as an origin, or there's another source outside both of them that they both took from, but one indirectly and the other directly? Most, most, uh, if, if we take the Bible seriously, it, we would say there is a common source. Um, Is the place where he shows him the images. Is it after the uh, Ten Commandments? There should be after. It's immediately after the Ten Commandments. Maybe it's in the beginning. Yeah, when he shows him. There's two places. One of them is he described it, and the other one he is building it. Mm. After the laws, seventh annual feast. Um, okay, chapter 25, verse 9. So he lists the things that's needed. God, is, the Lord spoke to Moses in chapter 25, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering for everyone who gives willingly. So at verse 9, he says, According to all that I show you, 
that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishing just so you shall make it um, and in the book of Hebrews and the New Testament also so this is the reference that he showed them there's another reference I think from maybe Deuteronomy I cannot find it now but it talks about these are the images of the heavenly it's reflection of the heavenly so in the book of Hebrews um, let to the Hebrews in this, in the New Testament. He comment on that. The writer of Hebrews comment on it. Shadow of the heavenly things. Chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very No, that's to come. I'm talking about the heavenly. Not to come. <coughs> Um, nine. It should be there right somewhere in the, between eight and ten. It was eight five. Yeah, it's 8-5. Oh, I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> okay, so now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have a, such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. So the heavenly tabernacle is made by God, but the other one, the earthly ones, are made by humans. But every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, therefore... It is necessary that this one also have something to offer. It's unheard of that he calls somebody a priest and he has no liturgical worship. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So he's talking about the Hebrew priest. So when Moses was shown here, this is it, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So the pattern shown on the mountain is almost like a slideshow of God's furniture. So this is the origin of the old and the new. And we have, uh, so the Old Testament offered a lot of incense on a specific altar, this altar of incense. And the incense is offered in the church from the first century onwards. Then uh, we have it now and we have it in heaven. And that's where we have it in the book of Revelation. There is incense offered at least two times now in our reading. This is the second time. Do we see it anywhere in Acts? I think Acts, they were still in the temple. The church of Acts... They go for liturgical worship in the temple. So they follow the temple practices. Mm -hmm. Because the church had not made a separation until St. Paul. 
it's temple who actually took them out of the that temple. was the job they used to go to the temple. we see how saint peter and saint john goes to the temple on the prayer hour they go through the prayer hour and they stand there the only thing they do outside the temple is their eucharist they break the bread but they continue to work through the liturgical cycle of the temple what they had done <coughs> is that they made themselves a special group within the temple in a way the sect mm -hmm. they called them the sect in the beginning then they called them the disciples of the disciples of christ and then they were called christians but that progress didn't happen like all of a sudden it's simple who ultimately said we don't need the temple we have no here a city to remain and when the temple was destroyed by god's permission this is how god planned it the christians woke up oh there's no temple now we're free we can build our own temple now. So the, the practices that was in the temple was transmitted to the... And the only they understood that there's no animal sacrifices anymore. We don't need animal sacrifices. And we have to, to continue to thank God and praise God for the gift of His Son. And that's how the, our liturgical <laughs> cycle started and our liturgical work started. But let us not forget, if you say a priest to, an, to a first century Christian, they would think Hebrew priest. It is unheard of that there would be a priest outside the temple or doing anything. So that the idea of being a Christian priest started after the temple practice way long gone. And we can actually, this is what we're doing. This is actually the work of the priest, but they didn't realize it immediately. It's difficult. Things like, for example, the fight that Paul had with Peter. That Peter was still stuck on the... And he said, I resisted him. He was wrong. And the idea of the Romans, which is a crazy idea, I think it's one of the greatest ideas, that Jews are not better than, than us. We are actually better. That's what St. Paul is saying. But he goes into that process of elimination. Jews thought they're better than Gentiles, but in fact, they were not keeping the law of God. Some Gentiles could potentially, but they didn't, because everybody was lost. So when Jesus came and gave us righteousness through his blood, then truly we became better. Now I can say I'm better. So, so it all is about faith, really. Yes. Nobody gets away. Right, right. It's not Gentiles or Jews. Exactly. Yeah. But then he says that. No one kept anything. No one could. He said, potentially you can say, like theoretically, that the Gentile could keep the law without having the law. He said, I'm Paul. But he said... That didn't happen. At the end, no one is righteous. N n never. No one. No one could do it. it in a way, you think about it, that he's saying some Gentiles are better than Jews. But it is not. He, at the end, he says, you can say this theoretically because they're hypocrites. The Jews are hypocrites. They do the things that they said not to do. But then, you look at the Gentiles. They're not, no, no one is able to. So at the end, everybody is in need of God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. And this is how Christ comes to give us God's righteousness outside any commandments. It has to be in trusting and faith in, in, in Him. So this is the point that is made. And so that transformation happened very slowly and very tediously. It is not like a, a night and day. It is not like that. It was very gradual. Um, so chapter 8 again. That incense part much incense that should offer it with the prayers. Here the other one was the incense is a symbol of the prayers. Here it is actually a companion. Incense is with, not a symbol. That he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Golden altar versus bronze altar. We, we read in the seals, in the fifth seal, that the bronze altar, there was no animal sacrifices. There were souls of people who died in the tribulation, martyrs. There, he saw, I looked behind, uh, underneath the altar, and there were the souls of people that were persecuted, or killed, actually, the word killed, for the testimony of Jesus. So there, this, was, this was the altar in heaven. is not a place where you sacrifice animals. It's almost like a home where you keep the storeroom of martyrs. The golden altar is a different thing. Just remember, so I keep reminding everybody. In the old temple, which is a shadow of the heaven, there is an outside court. People stay there. They don't enter. Remember in the story of Zechariah? 
Zechariah entered, he saw the angel, everybody was waiting outside the door. And he, when he came out, he said, why you took so long? It should have taken 10 minutes. You've been there for an hour and a half. What's going on? And he couldn't say anything. So the people were standing outside. Where they stand is two objects of bronze. And it shows that this is not a very holy place. It's just a place of, it's a practical place. A place of, not the honor, but more of a cleansing. Because what you have there is water and blood. Water and blood. Water in lavern is a basin of bronze, and a bronze altar also. So it's, everything is bronze. So it would be like if you were in your church, you would be in the nave, and you would have a baptismal font brought out in the front somewhere, and you'd set it down, and that would be a bronze altar, kind of like out front, almost like the tent. Except that it would not be the nave, it would be the narthex. It would be the... Floor. That far out? Yes. Okay. And the door is closed. Because if you, you think about it, our altar now is the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And then the nave is the Holy. So what happened after the church Oh yeah, it's got to be outside the door. There was a, a, a kind of a step up. Everybody who was outside the door came in the nave. And everybody who was in the nave came into the Holy of Holies. And it would make sense if you had to, uh, if you had to burn animal sacrifices, you would do it outside. Outside? There is no more outside. That's it. We're done. Jesus had brought us in, and He forever sealed that place. Yeah, but I'm I'm having the tent yes. here. That's, yes. that's that's exactly. So I'm saying, then we built yes. buildings. And exactly, yes. exactly, exactly. So that where you have the incense altar is the golden altar before, at the door, the threshold of the holy of holies. But the curtains were shut. But in heaven, the curtains are not shut. So that that altar stands before the throne of God, right there. Uh, so he offers the prayers with much incense, the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Remember the prayers of the martyrs in the fifth seal? They said, until when you do not take revenge. So what did they offer on the golden altar? Incense. Only incense. Only incense, no blood. But they sprinkle blood on it once a year in the Yom Kippur. But this is the place to offer incense. Okay. It's not a place to offer blood, blood sacrifices. So the golden altar is more like the church's altar. Exactly. It's a, in the church altar we have everything. We have the bronze altar where we offer the ultimate sacrifice. We have the incense altar because we offer incense. It is the table of showbread because we keep the bread there. It is okay. everything together. The whole fulfillment of the heavenly things that was prophesied about in Moses, comes to this one place. But then in the, in the New Testament, the priest stands at the threshold, where, the, where that threshold is, where the golden altar was, and he offered the prayer with an incenser. And that's what they told us when we were in training in the 40 days. He said, uh, you stand in this spot, because this is where the golden altar was. Is there yeah, a movie? There was a lot of smoke, you know? Yes. Is there a movie of that depicts all this? Or? The, it's, there's, a, there's a cartoon animation oh. called The Tabernacle. There's a couple of them. It's oh, beautiful. Cartoon? Yeah, animation, yeah. Animation? Yeah, it's typical just to make it like real. Although you can. That's how we're But it's more, it, so it can show you in 3D and moves around it and looks inside it and not so everything. It's called The Tabernacle. You find it on YouTube. It's beautiful. It's like 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay. So the prayer of those people, the saints, actually was offered in chapter uh, 5, I think. I'm sorry, 6. Chapter 6, 5th seal. When he opened the 5th seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And this includes the old and the new, of course. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge that's the key word. Judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So the response to this prayer is because he took that... Which altar? Uh, these are the bronze. That makes sense. That's outside. Yes. That's where the animals are slaughtered. Exactly. But now instead of animals we have... People. People. Souls of Their people. blood is running down. Yes. Exactly. Literally. That's the image. So the bronze altar is about sacrificed creatures, but in heaven there's no animals to be sacrificed. Yeah. This is the humans that was offered to God. Like any martyr. The image, the image. Yes, 
Exactly, imagery. So any, mar any martyr who, is, who offers his blood to God is going to be in that place. It's a special place. Okay? Um, so this, these people have prayers. And this is the thing. So their prayers are offered in, on the golden altar. So whatever happened they talk about is moved, in a way, transferred to the golden altar to be offered before the throne. Big deal. As if their voices are being really heard. Really heard, right. Yeah. So, and the smoke of the incense, which the prayers of the saints, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. That's the, the point. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, from the golden altar, which had the prayer, the sense, the incense. Well, this is bad. It is bad. And then he threw it to the earth. This is like a comic book, you know. <laughs> this is like theater here. This is, yeah, yeah, it this is, is imagery. This it's is like you're at the heart of you're at the heart of where you know God's presence is, and it's like nah. <laughs> but it's not, not as if the the instruction was when you hear when God hears the prayer is that let us have whatever the effect of this prayer reflected on. Because they ask him to avenge the yeah, yeah. from people on earth. In response to that, upon the, the goodness of Israel, and uh, so then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there was noises, thundering, lightning, and an earthquake. When that happens, so this is the herald of judgment. Then that, so that then the, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now that is an image back to. So it's all images coming from the old and the new. It's just like going back and forth. So once you hear seven trumpets, they were going back to Jericho. What was the story about Jericho? What, what were, were uh, why did that city have to fall? Jericho was the first fruit of the promised land. It had to be offered to God. And, and the, the, so usually in, in warfare in those days, you, took, you take humans as slaves and you take the gold and everything else and you keep it. But God said, this is the beginning of judgment to the Canaanites, which was foretold to Abraham. He said, the Canaanites are very evil people. Their judgment is coming, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. But you're going to have to take their place and execute judgment because what God said in the beginning, just I will remind everybody, so we don't get, we get lost in our thoughts. He said, I will send, in the first promise given to Moses, I will send bees and hornets before you, and they will drive these people out. That's my judgment. And then Moses said, sure, we'll do it. So they're excited. They're babies. God's going to carry them, take them. And he said, I'm not going to lead them through the Philistines because they're going to see war and turn back. I don't want to do that. Let them go around. Then they did the golden calf. And then they lost faith in God and said, we cannot enter the promised land when the spies came in. And God said, no, no. You will do the judgment. You will be the persons to execute it. Why? Because I want you, in your memory of the events of entering the promised land, to remember what happened to the people. I'm going to tell you what they did so that you don't do like them. They ended up doing more. In the book of Kings, as they write, the prophets write uh, the book, they said, Manasseh, for example, who sealed the fate of Jerusalem, offered his son, his children, as a sacrifice to Baal. So they did, and he used to, Ezekiel used to say, uh, that God is saying to them, they took my children and offered them to uh, devils. And he said, they, they do a lot of um, stealing, abusing, they have no justice, and Jeremiah spoke about it too. He said, if you, of, if you do justice, if you don't spill innocent blood, if you don't, if you don't, you don't, I will keep you in this thing. Don't keep bragging, we have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and you're not doing anything that will make you stay here. So this is the problem. The problem was that they entered the promised land, were supposed to enter it on God's power, but then when they failed to be a true people of God. God said, okay, you do it, so you actually keep it in memory. That what I was supposed to do, you would do it. So they became the executioners. I don't think that any executioner excuse me, would do an offense that would lead him to be executed. It would be very difficult. <laughs> That's very difficult to understand. All right, so this is the trumpets, and then that was the first city. 
Jericho was the first city. So the trumpets were a uh, herald or uh, uh, the, the instruments that uh, heralded uh, judgment. Judgment. So there's seven trumpets. I'm just going to go through the first. Read, the, read them just and leave them for next time. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third, a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Eight, and the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood, and the third of the living creatures in the sea died, and the third of the ships were destroyed. Third trumpets, that's fresh water. And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a, a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and on the spring, springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died. Many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The fourth trumpet, the fourth trumpet. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining last of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. Um, the first one is almost reminiscent of what? Just keep your associations up. First one. Hail, blood, and fire. <coughs> I think it's left these these images left for somebody who's good who's good with imagination and the facts. No? Hail and fire, what is that? Uh, so hmm? uh Salam Gomorrah. Salam Gomorrah was fire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. Not hail and fire. Hail mixed with fire. It's, it's a strange one. Mm -hmm. Like uh I stormed it's, it's, it's literally there in the Old Testament. Uh. <coughs> Are you not? The plagues? Huh? Yes. Plague? Yes. Yeah. Egypt plagues? Uh, Egypt yeah. plagues. Oh. Go to Exodus. I thought that would be too easy, so I'm saying it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, because we didn't, we didn't think that it was mixed with fire. We have hail, but it's not. We don't remember that. I will just go back with you to uh, the the place, and it starts in uh, in chapter five. Okay, well, then, then you've got sea became blood, and you've got bitter water. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually uh, the the uh, chapter uh, chapter nine, verse thirteen. And it's described in, it's a very, very vivid plague. Ah, verse 24. So there oh, yeah. was hail and fire mingled with the hail. So very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. So this is a reminiscent of, and the blood, that's the first plague. So uh, the first and the seventh plague mixed together. That's the first trumpet. Second trumpet, seas. We're going to talk about the uh, rest of the eight next time. So, but it is, if you go and read it, just think about previous events like this. So it starts by talking about trumpets. That is reminiscent of judgment, judgment on Jericho. Then he starts talking about judgment on, because <coughs> that's how it's described in the book of Exodus. I will execute judgment on Egypt. There's judgment on Jericho, judgment on Egypt. So it is, in a way, what do you get out of that? So it's starting to, <laughs> in, in, a, in a prophetic way, bring images from all the old nations that has been judged by God, one after another. What does that mean then? Like, I'm bringing in everything that happened to, uh, to the people that God judged. Fire, blood, hail, trumpets, and, and just, what does that mean? The judgment of... The world. Yeah. The world. Judgment of judgments. Like, this is it. The ultimate one. I'm not and sure I understand this. Hmm? I'm not sure I understand this, Annie. Why is the imageries of 
what happened before coming in Revelations, which is supposed to be telling us about what will happen. Well, maybe it's just, you know, it's imagery, you know, maybe it's connected, maybe it isn't, but, you know, people understand it and it's part of the tradition. Right. But but, but the, 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 I want to say the thing that would be assured that this would be a judgment that will surpass or so if Egypt got this, I'm going to give Egypt and Jericho. See, and Sodom. And the flood. So I'm going to keep all these to the end. In the mix. Say it again? In the mix. It's a mix. Like it's, a, so it's almost like the finale for the orchestra. You know how the orchestra starts with like duetos and uh, what do you call them? Like... The yeah, the recapitulation of the thing. Exactly. And so then, the theme, exactly. So in that final one, all the instruments are playing. <laughs> or fireworks, right? Really. Or fireworks. You see what I mean? That's the that's the point I'm trying to. I think I get from it. Like I'm gonna get everything happened before and put it in this. This is like theater, and God is the star, and He's coming, and. You can say this. Earth is like shaking. He's in control. That's it. He's yeah. in control, and He's not gonna let go. There is no living God. And that's Jesus saying, actually. He said that. He said that every word that person would say is not going to be let go when we say bad words or things that is idle. He said it. He gave us the warning. He said all the idle words or the idle talks that people are saying, they would have to give an account. Why did I say it? What was the purpose? I mean, we don't think about this as a, I mean, we have to take him seriously. If we don't take him seriously, you know, we should not follow him, simply. So this is what it is, that God is going to take charge of things. He, he, it seems now, that's what the, like the religion is saying, it seems now like everything is okay, everybody's doing whatever they please. But the time will come when these prayers are heard, and then God's going to take charge. Everything will be counted for. And then whatever Egypt had been doing to the Israelites for 400 years or whatever, he had to give an account at the end. And boom, 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 boom. The Canaanites have been doing whatever they were doing, and everything is peaceful. And they're doing everything they, they want to do. One time comes, and then. So the one more. And, and it goes on and on and on. And it, it is, that's the way the, God, the Bible is telling us. The Catholics have a nice thing to say about this, and I, I, I like it. And I think it is common knowledge in the New Testament. He says there is eternal judgment and there's temporal judgment. You've heard of this before. Eternal judgment, Jesus took care of. If we hang on to Christ, he will take care of it. Temporal judgment, it might not be really taken care of. That's why there is discipline. You read in Hebrews. It really has some like their discipline, like I have to correct you. It's in Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, if we are judged by the world, we're not judged with the world. What's he talking? If, they are, if we are judged by the Lord, we're not to be judged with the world. So that judgment that comes to the world for eternity, we have to be exempted from. So what would God do? Judge us, as we go. Judge us now. Right? Give us some pain, some calamity, some sickness. So we, we, we suffer some temporal... And the Catholics would stretch it out to say there's purgatory, so you judge here and judge it in there. There's also a thing called particular judgment. That's like your temporal judgment, but after you die, right. I suppose. That's but in a way, purgatory. it's just kind of the same thing. It's a little right. judgment for poor the biggie. The only difference we, we do as Orthodox is that we don't believe in purgatory as a judgment, a temporal judgment. So that temporal judgment can involve your body, your being here, or when we die and in the spirit, so we're judging the spirit, and and we don't believe in that. There's nothing for us to go by, but we believe that God disciplines us here. If we don't, you know, if we don't do well, we'll have some discipline, and that is not out of vengeance. He's not taking justice. He's just disciplining, like you take something from your child, or you, you know, give them time out or something. Any any good father would do that. He says, if we, and he compared the St. Paul in Hebrews in 12, uh, he said, if we would have temporal earthly fathers, and they disciplined us according to their, like, liking, they said, okay, I think you should 
be a week off your cell phone. Or I think you should uh, have no allowance for a month. That's what they say. According to the liking, I like it should be a month. How much more we should submit ourselves to the Father of Spirits that we may receive from His holiness because He wants us to be holy like Him. So that discipline is not geared to revenge, it's geared to improvement, right? right? You can call it judgment, you can call it discipline. If we had no need of discipline, then we have no need of discipline. That's not going to discipline us. He's not interested in making us suffer. Then definitely you have done something wrong, don't we need correction. But then that, that involves the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the other thing where the, 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 there's the earth being struck and the people being struck at the end. One might speculate why that's necessary, but I suppose that's, a, that's another story. But he was going to say that. He's going to say, when these things happen, people don't repent. They don't say, we're sorry, we've done something wrong. They don't realize that. They're going to come at one point and say, they didn't actually repent from their fornication, from their idolatry, from all the bad things they've done, because they're so habituated, so stuck on things, they cannot give them up. It's very difficult for them to go back. It's difficult. Even with that, with that they don't see it. So that's the, the thing. Sometimes God disciplines a person, but they, the person doesn't repent. They go on, I'm okay. I took too much food today. Okay, let's break it.